Welcome back to Game Warp. I'm Kim, and joining with me as always is my co-host Elwood Jones. How's it going, Elwood? Hey, Kim. Uh, pretty good. You know, we've still got the rainy weather, so it's a plus from all that horrible, sticky, sunny weather that we had with the uh, heat wave. And uh, now we're expecting a bit of a icy blast coming in, so it's only looking up for uh, folks like myself who hate the sunny weather. Okay, so today is a pretty special episode. We're having another interview. And um, I guess my first question to the audience is, have you ever heard of P-A-R-G? Um, do you know what it stands for? Before we you know, obviously go introduced with the two games which our guest is going to be talking about us today, I'd never actually heard of P-A-R-G. For those obviously not in the know, P-A-R-G is Permanent Alternate Reality Game. And Kim, I mean, do you want to obviously introduce our guest today? Yes. Um, our guest is from a company called Alice and Smith, and they developed a game called The Black Watchman, which is a PARG game. Um, and, it, and it expands further that they have another game in early access on Steam called A Nero, The Dream World, and a recent Kickstarter project that he'll talk about later on. So let me introduce Patrick. Welcome to the show. Hi, uh, thanks for having me on. It's great to have you. I'm really happy you came, uh, you came by to, uh, you know, to just have an interview with us and find the time for everything with all the busy schedule and everything. Um, so how about you tell, a little about, tell us a little about yourself and um, the background that you have and maybe your role at Alice and Smith? Yeah, no problem. I am a, one of the main uh, game devs at Alice and Smith. Uh, we're a team of six. And uh, my background is in film and TV, and my interests are mainly lie in story. So I, along with uh, one of my coworkers, really focus on the story and puzzle elements of our game. So uh, the alternate reality games are all about uh, narrative, uh, interactive narrative in terms of the choices of the, the community, and about complex, interesting, puzzles, not puzzles in the you know traditional puzzle game sense, but really spanning to code ciphers, research puzzles, logic puzzles, that kind of thing. And that's what uh, I really focus on is creating those puzzles, those research questions, and really digging into all sorts of weird topics and finding out how they can become fun to explore. Yeah. I think uh, you pretty much nailed it on the head there when you said weird topics, because Playing these two games, as we, I've been shooting the emails back and forth with Kim, there's some very unusual topics that these games will take you into researching and looking at. When you look at Black Watchmen, it will obviously take you down the path and you're looking into things like chemistry. You're learning about heavy water, uh, for example, what the early missions. You're learning about different codes. Uh, when we look at uh, Anya and Ro, I'm sure I'm mispronouncing that completely and I do apologize about this. We obviously have, it's completely opposite. It's a Victorian sort of setting. So with the early le levels we're learning about London, in particular Great Ormond Street and Sherlock Holmes. And we go a bit further into the game and we have these puzzles. But as you said, it's not puzzles in a traditional sense. We're given clues onto areas to research and it's about piecing it all together. Um, there was one, I believe, about... Uh, uh, Virginia Woolf, and there's another which is, uh, which gives you like a number of uh, different items, such as a bridge and a revolver, a dead end sign, and it was about piecing it all together. And the very unique games, as we were saying before we came on, I think this is the first time in my years of gaming that I've encountered a puzzle game like this. Uh, this is, in many ways, like if you were playing something like a D and D game or like something like Vampire the Masquerade is that sort of level of RPG, but on sort of more of a global scale because it's obviously based on the internet. It's not just you and your friends sitting in the basement trading stories. It's got this very immersive sort of storyline to it, especially in terms of Black Watchmen, where for more intense purposes, you could you feel like you're a spook, you're working for some secret agency because of how the codes and the puzzles are set out. And I think it's such an immersive uh, world that you've certainly created there. And uh, for that, I trade off, have to congratulate you because uh, it's, it's truly something special that you've uh, created here. 
Well, thank you so much. I mean, I feel like you've just pretty well summed up what permanent alternate reality game is. So first of all, thank you. Uh, it's a very nice compliment. But also, yeah, it, that's, that's really what permanent alternate reality game is all about. It's about, specifically with the Black Watchmen, it's about feeling like an agent. You, it's, you're not playing, uh, moving around an avatar be, that is an agent in some game world. It's, it's you that is the agent, and the way that the game presents the, the missions to you is, is as if you're sitting at your desk and you receive new missions from, you know, a, a handler. And so we really, that's something that we really strive for whenever we're creating any content is, you know, making you feel as if you're actually doing it. If that means, you know, emailing uh, NPCs using your real email, if that means doing, have you guys gotten to the uh, social engineering puzzle yet? That's a fun one. We created a character on Facebook, gave her 200 real friends, and then uh, basically you have to befriend her, figure out what she likes, and then use that information against her. That's called social engineering. That's a real technique that's used by spy agencies. So we learned about it. We got fascinated by it, and then we tried to figure out how we could make that a playable experience. That's really the kind of like puzzle we like to have in our games and it we really want you to feel like the role play aspect is really important too in terms of actually feeling like you're a member of a huge organization we our live events really promote that as well just with obviously the development of the game i mean yourself and your colleagues were you sort of rpg fans to begin with or was it more from sort of the film background that you wanted to create so this film experience where you could create a situation for people to sort of act out without the usual limitations that these sorts of games would come with where all the information you're given would be very self-contained it hasn't wouldn't have like you've created today where you have to go off and use google and different uh, apps to sort of research um i just obviously had to wonder whether which sort of background that came from really for some of us uh, in our team, we have uh, strong uh, D&D backgrounds. Uh, I myself have played D&D for uh, quite a while. But uh, I, I can speak personally on that, which is that when I was growing up, we used to do treasure hunts. My dad and uh, one of my friends and I, my dad would set up treasure hunts uh, you know, in the backyard. We went camping a lot too, so just around the campsite. And then let us loose to try and find what he'd hidden. And that kind of created a sense that you were exploring the world and the whole world had like purpose, it had a goal, it had a mission. And it, it, you know, even though it was just a couple things hidden around a campsite, it really felt as a kid like the whole world had this order to it and this clear mission forward and, and there was all this hidden stuff. And so for me, going into uh, alternate reality games, and I started in 2011 with alternate reality games, when I discovered them, I realized that you know they offer that same kind of experience, but online, where you're never really sure where it ends, and it kind of makes the entire world seem like it could be part of this game. And so that's really, that's my background, and that's kind of what I always strive for in terms of the experience that we want to give our players, is that sense of, you know, the entire... In internet is potentially in on the game. What's really common between the Black Watchmen and um, Aneiro is that they're both pretty much like they feel like Aneiro definitely feels more of a single person game, um, whereas like the Black Watchmen is more of like a community. You you can really like search up on forums everywhere and for both of them you can do that. And uh, to build a community like this, like it feels like it's a more of a community based game. Is there was that was that like an intention to like just m like make it a little bit more immersive as well? Traditionally, within ARGs, they were played on forums. So Unfiction is the uh, and Unform is the classic example. There's also Wiki Bruce. Uh, this is in the you know at the start of ARGs in the early 2000s because traditionally ARGs are meant to be played not single player. They're, they're, they'd be too hard to play in person. It'd be impossible, especially with the live components. So the the na nature genre is inherently cooperative um, and we obviously wanted the for the black watchman we wanted to make sure that there were single player elements and that's the you know in client missions you could if you were very very good at everything that uh, is put in front of you you could complete it by yourself but we really want to encourage people to work together so not only for the live events that we do but also for the missions so we have you know prompts something we're working on now is a hint system 
that is going to uh, go directly from our forums uh, for every puzzle and bring a hint that you can see in game that the community has provided. And that, that's really important because uh, in, the, in the missions that you guys have already experienced and throughout the game, they're about very specific things. And not everyone is a master of everything. Uh, so it, the, the way that the game is set up, so if someone's really good at languages, for instance, they might be able to translate something. If someone else is really good at, at reading ancient texts, they'll, they'll pick on other cues. We had, during a live event recently, we had a clue that was written that we thought was going to take a long time to solve that was written in ancient Cyrillic uh, numerals, very, very obscure text. But one of our players who was active during the live event is studying classic texts and specifically classic Russian text. So she recognized the script immediately, was able to translate it, and the community passed through that stage very quickly. So that's just an example of you know, the, the, the unique skill sets of one person being able to benefit the whole community. We really want to do that for the entire game. So community is inherently very important. I would say it's, it's quite an unusual degree to have, so it must make them feel like particularly great to finally have a use for this skill. Just obviously in terms of the community, I love the forums in the fact that if you go looking for answers, the community will more than likely give you hints. They will rarely give you an answer. And even if you're going onto YouTube, there's a number of users on there that will show you the mechanics of how to solve a puzzle, such as one of the early coding ones where you're looking at the crime scene documents and there's two lines of code yes. and when i was looking at it, it was all like i translated the first one and it gave me the the pace bin and then the second one i couldn't think to put the two together in my mind for whatever reason but the video was like oh yeah you take that one then you put that one there and they were sort of like but well, i'm going to fuzz out the answer i'm just going to show you the mechanics of how you can get that but you still have to solve it yourself and i find that with these games that Players are happy to give each other hints, but they rarely want to give the answer. There's a, almost like they don't want to take away the satisfaction of solving a puzzle. Uh, they're, they're happy to give a hint so it doesn't form those sort of walls that you used to get with like the old LucasArts point-and-click adventures, uh, where you just like hit this wall and just think, I'm either going to solve this or I'm just going to quit and go away. The, the community itself love to give each other hints and sort of motivate each other to keep each other going and progress further and so then you probably would that there's a number of puzzles as you said that require sort of specialist skills but the way your your community i don't know if this was intentional or, or what they the way they've organized themselves it it's really sort of more motivating than i've seen in a lot of games um so it's it's quite unusual especially for an rpg game as well Yes, yeah, so I mean, I think that the community really values the aha moment of solving a puzzle because it just feels so inherently good to solve it yourself. And so what that means, they want to show you the door without having you walk through it. So I think that that is really important. Also, just in general, our community is absolutely fantastic. I'm sure every game dev says that, but it's, it's, our community is, is really and truly fantastic, very supportive, very open, very welcoming. We have an IRC that uh, you know, is always online, and because our game is international, there are always uh, dedicated players that are on there that are just hanging out, and people will come on and say, hey, I need a, a hand with uh, this specific puzzle, this specific mission, and they'll instantly say, hey, just uh, private message me, I'll help you out. Because even there, they don't want to post you know, any hints so that other people would be uh, would be spoiled. It's it's our community is, is truly truly amazing. You know, like I feel like this is um, tapping into something completely like this is completely new to the market. Like the the Black Watchmen concept of the PARG, and I was just wondering, like, what were some of, were there like hurdles of entering into this market? Were you were there things that you worried about that actually did happen? Um. So the the biggest hurdle i would say is you know you guys are both uh big gamers and this is the first arg you've heard about that's the biggest hurdle right there is that uh this genre has existed for you know about 15 years now um and it's just not very widely known and so our biggest hurdle was just convincing someone uh about what what our game could do what our game could be without spoiling it because it's very hard to describe what an ARG is without experiencing it. And so I would say that's our biggest hurdle. And luckily, we've 
one, been able to build up such a good community that, that you know, gives us fantastic feedback, uh, brings new players to the community. We've gotten a lot of word of mouth uh, responses. And the other thing that, uh, that we do is, you know, we have a lot of, you know, YouTube streamers, people on Twitch that play the game and kind of, kind of show people what it's all about. But uh, I would say that's definitely one of the biggest hurdles and, and how we overcome it was thanks to our fantastic community and, you know, going out, I met you guys at DreamHack. So uh, going out and meeting people at conventions, doing a simplified version of puzzles there where we have briefcases and uh, a one sheet puzzle that, uh, you know, kind of gets people into the mindset. So, so things like that. But uh, I would say that was definitely the biggest thing. The second was obviously uh, getting shut down by the NSA. That was always a worry for us. Uh, hasn't happened yet, so we're all good. But, uh, yeah, jokes aside, that's, that, that was really the biggest thing. And uh, it's really not been, uh, it's turned out fantastically. People are, are super excited when they find out about our game. And the fact that we have the demo, so you can play that third mission in, in the, the Black Watchmen really kind of shows you the kind of game that it's going to be, and that's where a lot of people get hooked. So I feel like it's time to, you know, dive a little deeper. We've been kind of brushing along, like, what all these games are. So how about you tell us what The Black Watchman is? Uh, so The Black Watchman is a game where you play as an agent of uh, the titular group, The Black Watchman. It is a paramilitary group that does investigations into the occult and the paranormal. Uh, think of it as X-Files and Men in Black, but... Because this is the 21st century, it's a private organization. It's not uh, connected with any government. And they go in, they investigate the stuff that, isn't, that doesn't make the news, but it should. And they make sure that it doesn't make the news. So you're doing all sorts of investigations into secret societies, uh, ritualistic murder, uh, human experimentation, all sorts of fun stuff like that. Uh, and how you do that is you're, you're presented with a, a mission briefing and goals. And then you have to go out on the, on the Internet and complete those goals. So those goals might be, you know, decoding a specific code. They, they might be unscrambling images of, of certain, uh, you know, mutated babies. Or they might be things like doing social engineering, uh, researching a specific occult symbol and finding its meaning so that then you can communicate with a cult and join in, the, in their initiation. Uh, it's stuff like that. And that is the online component of it that is playable you know, by yourself whenever you want that's available on Steam. The other side of the Black Watchman is live events. Now, live events are things that happen in real time in the real world. So that might mean uh, taking recon photos. Uh, recently, we did a live event that involved recon photos taken of post office around the world. Uh, we got hundreds and hundreds of submissions from five different continents around the world. And that led to a video stream that had very specific puzzles that needed to be solved, which uh, landed us with a hostage situation in Sydney, Australia. And the community needed to come together in a very brief amount of time with the blueprints of the building in which the hostage situation was taking place and come up with an, ex an extraction plan. And now they worked together. They figured out in real life what kind of extraction plan uh, SWAT would use. And they submitted that to us. And then we went in based on what we had you know, already chosen and then gave them the outcome uh, based on their choices. Uh, so that's, a, that's one live event. Another live event that we did in May involved 12-hour interactive event with a uh, player on the ground in Vancouver, uh, British Columbia. And that he was interacting with uh, actors on the ground and the community through his phone everywhere in the world. And they were basically leading him through a day-long event to uh, save a kidnapped member of the Black Watchmen who had been kidnapped... Uh, by mercenaries that ended up working for the uh, Chinese consulate. Now, they had to meet with a consulate member, distract them so he could use a real hacking device, plug it into her computer, and gain sensitive information from the computer so they could hack the CCTV cameras of the Chinese consulate and we could save the kidnapped member. Of course, none of this actually happened <laughs> in the sense that we didn't actually hack the you know, CCTV cameras of the real Chinese conflict. But the player was in Vancouver. They did meet with someone claiming to be the, uh, a Chinese consulate member 
in an office. They did have an interview. They did actually have to hack the computer. So we really, uh, we really skirt that line in terms of what is and what isn't real. It definitely feels real, real for the fact that, I mean, I remember in like one of the early missions got me very, very interested. I think it immersed me the most was the, was having to plant bugs in a clinic. And it was just, it was like you were talking to a team that was like, well, we have to do this, but you know, this is when we recommend you do it. And obviously I play at night, so it was not a problem going into anything. And then it was like, you know, you had to figure out where in the blueprints you had to plant the bugs in order to, and that was super immersive like it it's just such a clever idea that to to feel so excited about like being part of something at the same time you're like oh my god like you actually have this like sweaty palms moment where you're like oh my god what if this is what if i ruin this if i get this wrong and you don't know what the outcome is going to be if you don't get it right you know so that's that's, e yeah. that's exactly the feeling we're going for and just to 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 go on briefly about that specific mission you're uh, you're planting bugs to get at a phone so you can tap a phone and you're dialing a real phone number now if you dial that phone number in real life on your phone that's the clinic's phone number so you can do that in real life we also do that in terms of phone puzzles mail puzzles we've done that uh, so there's that component as well but that feeling you're talking about is exactly what we strive for for every single mission. So that's great. <laughs> I have to say, the scope that this game has is absolutely dizzying. And to think that this is, I'm right in saying, an independent release. This isn't a AAA release. We're not talking about a company that's pumping like millions of dollars into getting this off the ground. I, I'm assuming this is like an independent team that you're part of. Is that correct? Yeah, we're six people. I mean, that again just makes it even more staggering the fact that for six people can put together what feels like a very entire world. There's so many moments when you're playing this game that, and you're researching information, you're going to these sites that have been set up. And in even though part of your mind knows that, oh, it's, it's part of a game, the other part of your mind thinking, am I like stumbling into like some dark web stuff? Am I going to end up with like the police kicking down my door? Because I have like unearthed government files that I'm not actually supposed to be looking at. And this is all just like part of some covert operation to have gamers do dirty work for them, but it's absolutely dizzying the details that go into this isn't when you look at these files and stuff it's not like just very sort of base level information and like loads of information like blacked out with just like small amounts in there there's pages and pages of like documentation medical records uh you mentioned already about the the deformed babies that you have on the radiation level because one of the things I like to do whenever we get given a game is like to try and identify who the player is. And like looking at this, I was thinking, oh, someone could do this in their office when they're supposed to be working or whatnot. And then obviously that puzzle came up and I was like, if you're in your office and you've got deformed radiation babies come up, I don't think your boss is going to be overly pleased. But yeah, it's, as we said before, this the scope of this game and just obviously with the live events, it's staggering that what you're achieving here and the fact that it's within this RPG style that I've not encountered before, even though you've obviously said it's existed before. It, before, this isn't something you've come up with. This is uh, an established concept that you're working with. So the, the, the deformed baby is, is a perfect example of why we're able to do what we're, we're, we're able to do. Because for that level specifically, uh, I won't go into detail of where, where exactly that's from, because uh, that could be a spoiler. But uh, that's from a, a Soviet uh, nuclear testing facility. And those, those babies uh, were unfortunately part of the side effects of that, uh, of that testing. Now, when we found that out, we did some research into it, found out that there's a museum uh, and that there's a specific kind of tourism that uh, people are interested in called dark tourism, where people go to places like that and take photos we found a dark tourism website that does reviews of museums like this and contacted the owner and said, we would be very interested in using some photos that you've taken of this museum for our game. You know, would you be interested in, in working out something with the rights for us? And the person said, yeah, that sounds great. Please just, you know, link, uh, link to my website. I'd be happy to, to give you these, these photos. And so that, that's a perfect example of, of how we're able to do what, what we do is just we, we meet very, very interesting, enthusiastic people uh, who have connections to all sorts of stuff. And, you know, we, we work very closely with them to make sure that the, we get the, we can have interesting content like that. Yeah, so, you know, I mean, this is, you know, we learn something new every day. I've heard of, like, 
extreme tourism, and now there's dark tourism. It's, it blows my mind what people are interested in sometimes. But then, I mean, I also have a darker self that I, I like, like a dark tone things that I like to go into. Like, you know, we recently reviewed uh, Limbo and oh, Inside, okay. and, you know. So, I guess Black Watchmen and a Nairo, are they supposed to exist in a same universe, in the same world? Yes, yeah, so uh, the idea is that, you know, we've created an alternate reality, so it's very similar to this reality. It's just uh, everything is kind of real in it. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of paranormal stuff that happens in uh, that reality uh, more openly. Maybe that stuff happens in this reality. Who knows? But specifically in all of our games, uh, and this will be true with uh, 194 as well, there are specific references that are used uh, cross game. So I really like to use the example of uh, William Gibson, one of my favorite authors. In a lot of his trilogies, um, between books, there will be uh, not so much a continuation of a single story, but references to characters, to events, to organizations. And that's how he strings together a world within the trilogy of one of his books. So we do something similar with uh, you know, our games where uh, in a Nairo there are references to specific organizations that you investigate in the Black Watchmen. Uh, 194, a new game, is the cyber warfare division of the Black Watchmen. So there's an immediate connection. I would speak more specifically about what the connections to a Nairo and the Black Watchmen are but unfortunately, that's a spoiler. <laughs> yeah. So what is a Nairo? So a Nairo is a game that takes place entirely in the dream world, except uh, for a, a companion transmedia experience uh, that takes place in the waking world. But the most of the game takes place in the dream world of a dreamer that is plagued with these reoccurring dreams uh, that are haunted by... A presence and they're really not sure what that presence is and by completing a series of research-based puzzles around Victorian themes mythological themes uh, art history uh, they become they become closer and closer to uncovering the identity of the presence within their dream and that presence is going to help them uh, emotionally and it's going to help them get further into the dream so we're in early access right now we've released two tables uh, there's going to be four tables total uh, for the, the primary game. And each table kind of explores a specific uh, historical figure and explores a specific emotion. Uh, so the first, uh, the first table is all about depression and how that could affect someone's dreams, but also the story of this historical figure and how uh, she would impact someone's dreams if she were to be in there. So it's a little bit more of a, a laid-back uh, experience than the Black Watchmen, but it's still we we're very much going for the uh, the ethereal feel. I mean, I have to ask you obviously have all these ideas that you bring into both games. I love the fact that you got two games that uh, while they're they're similar, they this tone is very different to each other. You obviously have Black Watchmen, which is very modern day, um, a few which is very Victorian sort of setting, even though it touches upon later periods within its game. I always felt when I'm playing it, it's kind of like how Alan Moore portrays Victorian sort of London sort of setting. I have that sort of feeling when I'm playing the game. And I love the fact that the game has been set up so you can only play it at night. Um, yes. As though you're imposing this sense of this is the tone we want to have for this game, that it has to be played these conditions. We want you it's like we don't want you to like treat it like a horror movie watching it during the day we want you to watch it in this sort of setting that perfectly suits this game and certainly with the music and the imagery and everything else it and by playing it at night it certainly does create a very much a tone of its own um what i have to ask though is has there been any ideas that you've sort of had that'd be like really great to do but have just obviously not played out when you've come to put them into practice uh, well, I mean, specifically with Enero, I think it's very important for us that the, the mood that you're talking about is something that we really, really want to focus on um, and just creating this really kind of dreamlike state. And uh, something that we've, uh, you know, that we're very careful about is the, the puzzle design within Enero needs to follow a specific logic and it needs to flow. 
And so there's been certain things that we wanted to explore specifically because it's a you know historic game and we want to explore interesting facets of history, but we just didn't feel like that flowed really well with the the general themes. So I, the, nothing specific comes to mind, but more just generally, we, we really want there to be a kind of treasure hunt through logic that happens within within an arrow and that definitely uh, limits us in in cert, from certain uh topics the other thing in a, in an arrow is that once you've uh completed one of the so how an arrow breaks down is you have tables with objects and fragments and if you, once you solve all of the fragments within an object you will have to link them together so that's been very interesting for us because not only are we designing isolated puzzles but every single puzzle has to link up to uh, a, a major theme, and then the entire table needs to link up to a specific person. So it's just been a very interesting approach for us in terms of level design and puzzle design in a way that something like The Black Watchman isn't, because The Black Watchman, as you're following various aspects of you know, a, a secret agency's missions, you would be exploring all sorts of different kinds of things. Whereas a narrow, we're really trying to kind of create more of a holistic feel for the, the puzzles. I, I, I like that you said that because that's particularly why I was really hooked with a, a narrow. I keep saying it wrong. I've said it in a thousand ways now. And, you know, um, like that was what I like. It was just so much logic that you had to piece together all these things, all these objects, and you had to go dive into all the research and then kind of just link it all together. And sometimes it's as, as simple as just, finding like one knowing where to start you know and, mm -hmm. and that's where the forums really work so well because sometimes when you don't know where to start you just like you go on and then you're like okay well people are like well you start if you figure out this link then what's on this link that works then the other ones you know they're all like you know read through what you research you know and then you'll figure it out and that's really good because the black watchman is more is more time consuming in the sense where there's so much more to learn to do in in just the different puzzles and the different missions and all sorts of like I've only been through like less than 10 missions and like every single mission has different things to do and whether it's decoding whether it's all those things like you have to slowly grasp it before you and then like you know by the time you hit to where I am and it's like advanced difficulty and I'm like what I've learned everything that I had to <laughs> I don't think so <laughs> So I, I don't know. I mean, um, I, I love, I like, I really love, I look forward to like um, a Nero getting out of like the early access and having more things open up, although I'm stuck on a puzzle right now. <laughs> well, yeah, that's, that's something that we're really looking forward to too. Uh, it, there's, there's a, a very different theme in uh, the second table that we were releasing. It's all about voodoo. And uh, that has been very fascinating uh, for me personally, just learning about, you know, all the differences between, uh, Haitian voodoo, West African voodoo, and Louisiana voodoo, for instance. But we're also going to have more of a uh, kind of explanation of a, what is happening in the dreamer's waking life, and that is going to be only that is going to be playable by day. So while we want players to be able to you know, experience the dream world of a narrow at night, they're going to be able to learn a little bit about the life of the dreamer during the day. It's, it's these sort of ideas that it's the reason that we're not getting any other work done at the moment because we're just so caught up in these games. I think just going back over my previous email, like emails this week, I think 95% of it has been about trying to solve puzzles or Kim like sending me her own hints because she's normally more switched on and with focusing things. And it's sort of like I send her, it's like, oh, I think it's this idea. And she's like, maybe it is. <laughs> why you and I'm thinking, yeah. it's like why didn't you try and I'm thinking well I've got another three hours before I can access the game because it's like the middle of the afternoon and it's that joy of working things out with other people as well as for yourself it, it creates all these different levels of joy and I love as well the fact that you've not tied it down to any particular character that you're playing so how you perceive your character within the game is completely up to yourself in many ways um, I know with Black Watchmen I've sort of view it when I'm playing it I'm sort of like oh I'm this entry level guy who's joined the organization I have a friend who's playing it he's like yeah I'm just some slub who works in the office who isn't talented enough to go out in the field so they basically <laughs> stick him behind a desk and I'm like this is what you aspire to when you play an RPG is to be some slub <laughs> uh, but 
as I said, the, the game allows you to be essentially whatever hero, if that's the right word, to when to uh, be the person who's obviously following the story. So as I said, it's such an engrossing experience. It's uh, hard not to to stress that enough, really. Um, well, yeah, th- thank you. We have a we have a dedicated uh, role play section in both uh, the forums for Nero and uh, the Black Watchmen. And it's really interesting. I mean, you know, uh, we have our players are, are communicating daily entirely within role play uh, on those uh, forums. And uh, it's 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 really, you know, fascinating just how uh, detailed uh, people's characters are. Another example of that is the uh, once a season uh, in the Black Watchmen, we have something called the Green Level event, which is what, what, what took place in... Uh, Vancouver with the day-long event by the one player. Uh, we did something similarly in Toronto uh, last year. And for that, the community votes on one player to be that green level agent. And that player is going to be transported to a city and have a 24-hour full-on immersive experience. And the way that that's done is we have a five-page application form which the community the uh, players fill out and that is entirely role play now they submit it to us we black out anything that could identify them in terms of the specific player so that it's not a popularity contest it's based entirely on the role play and then we have the community vote and it's absolutely fascinating the the kind of responses that we've gotten from players with those application forms, just because for so many people, they say that it's, well, it's kind of me, but more augmented, or I've, you know, I've polished up some aspects of the knowledge I really know. I don't actually know how to, you know, hack into a mainframe, but I, I, I took some computer classes. And it's that, that kind of thing is, is really the, you know, that, that's really validating for us as game devs. Uh, another uh, great example of that is we had a mail pu- uh, we had mail puzzles in uh, season one and two, and we needed to make sure that if we were going to send them to people, that we were sending them to the right address. So to validate people's addresses, we sent them something called hell notes. And hell notes are uh, within uh, Chinese tradition. You burn them at funerals for uh, your dead ancestors to be able to spend in hell. And so we had these hell notes which appeared at a funeral. And so they had to be buried. They couldn't be burnt. And we sent them out one hell note to you know everyone that signed up for it. We had hundreds and hundreds of people sign up. And they had to bury it in their backyard, make a little shrine out of rocks, and say a prayer in order to banish the spell. And we got videos submitted to us from players all around the world. And one really stands out. It was a player in a small town in Switzerland. And he climbed to the castle outside of his, uh, outside of his town, right to the center of the castle, this, this old, ru- the ruins of a castle, and then buried the hell note right in the center. And he filmed a, a whole uh, role-playing video of him doing it, narrated, uh, complete with jump scares, Blair Witch style. It was really, really well produced. And all because we had to validate, you know, addresses. And that is the kind of commitment that when we see that, it just, that does it for me, you know? That's, I, I, that, that happened a year ago, and I still think about that every week. It sounds like the way the game's evolving, it's falling somewhere between that Michael Douglas movie, uh, De- no, Michael Douglas, uh, David Finch movie, The Game, and the Black Light Haunted House experiences, where, for those not familiar with the Black Light experience, it's basically where you sign up for this experience, and you'd be walking down the street, and you go down an alley, and you'd be taken in the back of a van or whatever and you go for this sort of essentially a, a torture horror experience from what I've read it's the sort of thing I personally would want to do because being tortured isn't my, really my idea of being fun even if it is under controlled circumstances but certainly from what you're creating here it's falling somewhere between the two it's that very immersive experience and in many ways you're providing what's missing in people's lives because people obviously work the 9 to 5, they're not spies or work for secret government agencies but within what you're providing you're essentially giving them the chance to if only for that short brief window of time the chance to live out in a controlled uh circumstance this sort of experience so that 
you know, for that one day they were a spy. Exactly. It's very interesting how you're choosing to evolve the game rather than just trying to find new sort of codes, puzzles, ways to do things just on an internet basis. The fact that you're now looking at the game in a reality sort of basis as well as its internet sort of basis and having that sort of community aspect is very interesting, obviously, how you choose the direction you're choosing to evolve the game, certainly. Uh, we always say, you know, the game is whatever you put into it. And just the, the, the level of commitment that people put in means that we just, we, you know, owe them to keep making uh, get content that they will be able to consume in this engaged way. Like, it's just, it's so, it's, like I said, it's just staggering how much commitment and how much people are, are interested in role-playing as agents. And I, I've talked to, to some of my players, I've interviewed them, and, you know, they say, no, I, I am an agent of the Black Watchmen. In a certain <laughs> sense, I know spycraft. I know how to crack ciphers. I know how to, you know, send hidden messages. And I have access to a global network of people like me. So it's, it's just really neat, you know? It definitely is. And, and, you know, if it's not busy enough that you guys have two projects going on with a team of six, now you guys have recently just launched the Kickstarter campaign for Night Team 4. And can you tell us a little about that? Certainly. Well, um, I can say on the day of recording, uh, we, are, we launched today. Uh, and we, the last I checked, we were at 50% of our funding goal, which is absolutely fantastic. And we'd just like to thank everyone for that. Night Team 4 is all about modern cyber warfare. And what that means is basically government hacking units that perform new forms of warfare between one another, rogue states, and uh, hacking groups. And it is a true, the more we learn about it, the, the more we're absolutely fascinated with it, because it's, it's essentially the way that a lot of warfare is going to be uh, fought, uh, is being fought, and will continue to be fought, uh, both through traditional kind of hacking and stealing of information, but also in terms of destroying infrastructure with very particular things, uh, doing drone reconnaissance, all sorts of stuff like that, and influencing people through social engineering. Uh, so as a member of uh, Night Team 4, you are going to be part of an elite hacking group that is the cyber warfare arm of the Black Watchmen. And you will be uh, performing missions that will involve recon, research, infiltration, but also then uh, commanding uh, strike teams on the ground that are going to go in, uh, disable infrastructure, do targeted assassinations, uh, do all sorts of reconnaissance, and destroy infrastructure. So uh, a perfect example of that is something called Stuxnet. Now, Stuxnet is unofficially a uh, joint Israeli-U.S. project. It was never, uh, obviously, they never admitted to it. But uh, the Iran nuclear program uh, was getting pretty serious in terms of their nuclear power plants. And their nuclear power plants were entirely offline in the mountains uh, in Iran. But they, a, uh, a joint uh, Israeli-U.S. Uh, task force was able to go in and plant a virus via USB key into the actual mainframe of this power plant and basically tell the generators to run faster than they should. So the whole thing overheated and it was destroyed. Millions and millions of dollars of infrastructure was destroyed through this form of cyber warfare where no one was killed, no one was harmed, but you know, essentially an entire uh, military, uh, or sorry, an entire uh, nuclear program was disarmed. Um, and that is an example of the kind of thing that, uh, cy the, the kind of cyber warfare that is actually happening today. And so that's the kind of thing that we want to explore in 19.4. It's just a whole new aspect uh, to it. In many ways, it sounds like what they try to do with Black Hat, but you making it actually sound interesting. Um, <laughs> with, with these three games, you've managed to not only craft a very sort of, sort of combined world, but you've created three very different games, even though they're very much using, they're using the same uh, RPG style. So, I mean, I obviously have to ask, I mean, where do you go from here? Um, you've obviously got 
the free games that you're currently developing at the moment i mean what's the sort of next step i mean do you have any sort of thing on the development plan that you want to sort of discuss i mean What's coming up uh, in the near future, obviously, is the uh, is going to be uh, the full release of a narrow. Uh, we're also releasing a second DLC for the Black Watchmen. It's called Alone in the Dark Web. That was voted on by the community. That uh, topic, and it's uh, I know I love the name. Um, I, I, I take no credit for it. Uh, it was all my coworker, and uh, that is exploring a. Uh, king in yellow style website that would exist on the dark web basically what would happen if something like the king in yellow were today well it would probably be on the dark web and what would that mean how would that spread how would people find out about it and how would you stop something that was making people go crazy that was being shared on the internet uh, specifically on the dark web so we're very excited about that. In terms of 19.4, we're going to be developing that and developing that to uh, to an extent based on the success of the the Kickstarter. It's it's it could be quite quite a large game depending on the uh, the the stretch goals we reach. Um, so we're we're very excited about that. And then there is uh, the talk of uh, season three of the Black Watchmen, where what we we really want to take what we have now with the Black Watchmen and bring it to the next level both in terms of even more immersive single-player missions that you're playing in your clients and more cooperative live events that are taking place in the real world. Uh, so that is something that we're really experimenting with right now, and that is you know, something that uh, we're definitely excited about on the horizon. So those three, fi finalizing an arrow, building 19.4 based on the community feedback. Once again, with the Kickstarter, we're doing a, a vote on the main narrative of the story. So we did research into real cybersecurity threats that threaten uh, basically the world right now, created three scenarios based on those, and the, the Kickstarter community is going to vote on which one they want to see built into a full game, and then uh, releasing a DLC uh, for the Black Watchmen, which allow us to experiment with all sorts of new things. Uh, leading towards uh, a season three of Black Watching. Well, it's certainly a full slate that you uh, that you have there, and it's going to be a, it's going to be a busy busy time. i have had to say, how are you managing all this with just six people on your team? It's sort of it sounds like quite a a feat that you've uh, that you've got ahead of yourself to juggle all, all these different projects. So uh, I can only wish you the best of luck with them, really. Oh well, thank you. Uh, yeah, we're we're uh, a very efficient team, and uh, all of our backgrounds, you know, uh, my background, for instance, is is in film and TV, indie film and TV, and it's all about doing a ton of stuff uh, with a limited number of people. Uh, and so, you know, we just all work really hard, and uh, we're so passionate about everything that we do that we we make sure to get it done and and get it done well with the feedback of our community. Uh, that's that's something that we're that we're really passionate about is, you know, having the community vote on things, uh, sending out alphas and betas and, and really getting the feedback from our community and changing them because of that. And so it's because, you know, of, of the thousands and tens of thousands of Black Watchmen players that we're able to, uh, to do all this stuff. Cool. Um, well, obviously, if people want to uh, find out more about Black Watchmen um, and IO, your company in general, I mean, uh, where's the best places to, uh, to find out more? Um, so I will immediately ask everyone to uh, check out uh, Night Team 4 on Kickstarter. Uh, that's Night, N-I-T-E, uh, Team, the number four. Uh, so that's going to be on Kickstarter. Uh, the Black Watchmen uh, is available on Steam. You can get the first season, the second season, and uh, the DLC Mother Russia. Uh, and Nairo the Dream World is something that I will definitely uh, have you guys put in the show notes so that it can be properly spelt uh, <laughs> because uh, it is rather hard to, to pronounce and uh, say, but you can also find Nairo the Dream World on Steam. Um, and for simplicity's sake of finding them, if you can find one of them, you can find both because we have uh, bundles. Well, we'll yeah. um... As always, yeah, so uh, that's definitely yeah. There's never any problem. Everything will be in the description as always. Perfect. Yeah. So thank you so much for joining us uh, for this interview. We really, really appreciate you taking out the time to just explain the game and because it's such a unique concept and it was such a great gaming experience that you know even I can't wait to get back to continuing my missions and getting back into my role. 
Um, this wraps up this episode. Uh, thanks everyone so much for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please like, share, subscribe, and comment. We'd love to hear your feedback. Head over to our home base, thatmomentin.com, to read more game reviews. To get gaming news and releases every single day, follow us on Twitter and like us on Facebook at GameWark Podcast. To listen to us on the go, you can find us on iTunes, SoundCloud, Podomatically, Podomatic, and recently on Satchel. Uh, all the links will be in the description below. See you next time. Bye.